We take gravity for granted. We assume it is an invisible force that is able to act across an infinite distance in the blink of an eye. We are taught at school the basics of Newton's laws and the main concepts of Einstein's theory of general relativity. What we are not taught is that Newton himself questioned the very nature of gravity and that there are fundamental problems with our basic assumptions of general relativity and the concepts of gravity. Sir Isaac Newton remarked in the 17th century, the logical mind competent in philosophical matters finds it inconceivable that one object might act on another across a guild of space without some intermediaries passing between the objects to convey the action. The alternative would require some form of magic, an effect without cause. As such, it would violate the causality principle, one of the fundamental principles of physics. To be clear, these principles have a higher status than the so-called laws of physics. The laws may change as our understanding changes. The principles of physics are deductions about nature so closely related to pure logic that a definite observed violation of one of them would bring into question the very nature of the reality we live in. Now this troubled Newton very deeply, and he made no explicit hypothesis about the fundamental nature of gravity, leaving open the question of the agents that convey it. Gravity has many properties unlike most other forces of nature. Its effect on a body is apparently completely independent of the mass of the affected body. This means that heavy bodies and light bodies fall in a gravitational field with equal acceleration. This is counterintuitive. For most other forces, heavier objects resist an acceleration more than lighter ones. The main reason for this is because gravity is able to act on all the constituents at once. But when we apply a force to accelerate something, this is only being applied to the outer surface. This then passes the force on to the neighbouring atoms and requires them to change their motion, diluting the effect of the force across the remaining non-contacting atoms, creating what we see as a resistance to the motion. The larger the body, the more atoms or molecules this has to happen to, creating the appearance of greater resistance to motion. Therefore, any force that can act on all constituent particles at once will not see this difference in resistance to motion from large bodies to small bodies. Another important property of gravity is how the intensity drops off with the square of the distance from the source. It is important to realise that anything that spreads in two dimensions while propagating in a third will have this same property. Another often overlooked property of gravity is that it is an instantaneous action. To illustrate this, we know that it takes light from the sun about 500 seconds to travel to Earth. So the sun we see in the sky is actually from a position where it was 500 seconds ago. The difference is about 20 seconds of arc, and this is large enough to be measured by astronomers. From the Earth's perspective, this seems logical. When we view this from the Sun's perspective, we see that the Earth is travelling at a fixed speed with the Sun emitting light in all directions. So it would appear like the Earth is running into the light from the Sun. And the angle difference in both cases is called aberration. It is a classical effect, not a relativistic effect. Now it would be logical to assume that gravity would act in a similar way to light. And if this was the case, then it would appear like gravity was emitting from a position where the Sun was when the gravity left the Sun. Conversely, from the Sun's perspective, it would appear as if the Earth was running into the gravitational field, making it appear as if it was emanating from a position in front of it, causing a slight acceleration forwards. The problem is that the observations show that none of this happens. 
the direction of the Sun's gravitational force is towards its true instantaneous position. Gravity has no detectable aberration. The third point is that gravity is always an attractive force. Now these three properties are described by Newton's universal law of gravitation. This law is still taught in schools today and is used to calculate the force of gravity in everyday life without any error. As we started to observe planets more closely, it became apparent that the perihelion of Mercury was precessing. Newton's laws could not account for this anomaly, and this is where Einstein's theory of general relativity was able to account for this motion. When Newtonian gravity was replaced by Einstein's general relativity, two possible interpretations of the nature of gravity came with it, the field or the geometric. We are more familiar with the latter than the former. In the geometric model, a mass curves the fabric of space, called space-time, around it. Now, Due to this warping of the fabric of space-time, we remove the force of gravity and any notion of an agent to carry that force. This means that a body will follow the curvature rather than following a straight line. And this model worked well for any object that already possesses motion. What is not widely appreciated is that this is purely a mathematical construct and lacks any mechanism to initiate the motion. If we take an example of a large mass curving space-time, like the Earth, and we take another particle and place it motionless, there is no reason for this particle to start moving towards the other. Again, we are projecting our assumptions of the world we live in. In this analogy, the fabric of space-time knows no up or down, and there is certainly no gravity to pull an object down along the curve. So this particle has no reason to begin any motion unless a force acted upon it. This model therefore lacks physical and causal mechanisms. The second interpretation of general relativity allows for a field interpretation of its equations. The concept of fields is not well defined in terms of their structure. They do represent a type of agent between source and target, able to convey an action. In this model we have none of the problems with regard to the geometric model. The problem here is that all existing experimental evidence requires the action fields to be conveyed much faster than the speed of light. And this is one of the main reasons the geometric model gained popularity as the faster than light interpretation allows for causality violations. In special relativity anything travelling faster than light would be travelling backwards in time thereby creating a paradox. But special relativity is not the only theory that could be used. What is not well known is that there are an almost infinite number of theories that are mathematically equivalent. One of these, the Lorentzian relativity, has even shown to be in full accord with all 11 independent experiments that test special relativity in the light speed or sub light speed domains. And this theory does not forbid faster than light propagation and allows the field theory to be a valid one. Now there are further problems with gravity. The galaxy rotation problem. Now this is something we have covered before. The upshot here is that given the observable mass of a galaxy, the outer part should be rotating slower than the inner part, and what we actually see is that they all rotate at the same speed, meaning they should fly apart, yet they don't. In order to solve this, they had to dream up dark matter to help spread the mass out across the outer part of the galaxy, allowing this type of rotation. A simpler solution may be to consider that gravity only acts over a very small, finite range. Gravitational shielding. There are some well-documented experiments that show a small shielding effect from gravity, 
If this is true, this cannot be accounted for by the current gravitational models. We will be examining some of these experiments in more detail in future episodes. As you can see, the story about gravity is by no means a slam dunk. And sure, for some of these points there are indeed counter-arguments as to why some of these anomalies exist. What is clear is that we take a lot of this simply for granted, without really considering that there may be alternatives, like for example the hard limit we place on the maximum speed of propagation. If we use the Lorentzian special relativity equations, this becomes possible. So over the next few episodes I want to explore alternative ideas about how gravity works. To begin with we will venture right back to the era of Newton and explore one of the main concepts of how gravity was transmitted at this time and one that Newton himself actually supported for a considerable time. And in this concept we actually turn the whole notion of gravity on its head. Rather than gravity being a pull force, gravity becomes a push force. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.